Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Olivia Las Gonzalez. I'm the gallery director here, and I want to welcome you to this program, um, which features David Anderson, who's the co-curator of the exhibit that surrounds you, uh, Imagining the Founding of St. Louis, which we mounted in celebration of the city's 250th birthday. The exhibit is organized into four sections, the roots, the people, the trade, and the moment. And the uh, exhibit and accompanying catalog examines a variety of imaginings, um, that is to say paintings, and drawings of the founding of St. Louis and pays tribute to the contributions of Missouri's native people in the um, wonderful array of um, artifacts and art objects that we have from um, the Osage, the Missouri, uh, Illini, uh, and of course the wonderful Mississippian pieces that we have here. Uh, we were um, grateful to get loans from the Missouri History Museum, the Osage Tribal Museum, the St. Louis Mercantile Library, uh, the Science Center, uh, and then a number of uh, private collections including Timothy Drone, the Faust family, Nancy Pillsbury Shirley, and Rex and Jean Sinkfield. Uh, we also have a wonderful contemporary section uh, back there with artists David Hanlon, Michael Haynes, Philip Sline, James Michael Smith, and uh, Eugene Standingberg, who gave a wonderful talk last um, Saturday. Uh, the exhibition would not have been possible without the generous support from um, the Mary Pillsbury Fine Jewelry Company, Ameren, Bellefontaine Cemetery and Arboretum, Eleanor J. Moore, the Ed and H. Pillsbury Foundation, the Bannister family, and Barbara and Arthur McDonald. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about David's background. He is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, was a nuclear engineer and submariner, with an MBA from the University of Chicago. He served as CAO of a number of private companies over 35 years before retiring in 2010 and returning to his lifelong passion, art. Uh, some of you may know that he's a wonderful watercolor artist. I know their uh, student of his is here today. Uh, he currently serves on boards for the Sheldon Art Galleries, the Mercantile Library Art Advisory Board, the College of Fine Art and Communication at the University of Missouri St. Louis, and Les Amis. He teaches studio art at UMSL, watercolor workshops across the country, and monthly watercolor classes in studio gallery in the Lafayette Square neighborhood of St. Louis. So we're delighted to have David, whose brainchild uh, this exhibit really was. He came to us with the idea to bring together uh, images, paintings, drawings, um, and such like, uh, depicting the founding of St. Louis. And so um, we kind of ran with it and added to it. And uh, so it's a marvelous exhibit, and we're really grateful to you for um, bringing it to us. And, Anyway, without further ado, I hope you welcome David. It was Olivia who wanted to do an exhibit on the Osage and on the native population. And so when we first discussed doing something on the incoming French and celebrating the founding moment in 1764, she said, let's do a combination of both where we look at both populations at the same time. And so that's how all this came together. And uh, great loans from SLAM, the Art Museum, and great things from the Osage Travel Museum out in Pawhuska. Um, they were very generous because there's some just wonderful pieces uh, in this collection and this exhibition. By the way, this, uh, this is the exhibition catalog um, with uh, history by Fred Faust, who teaches history at UMSL and uh, articles by Olivia and myself, but this is um, really nice. Uh, and it has all these, or I think maybe all, or almost all these things in it. So if you're interested, uh, you can see Becky or, or Olivia about that. Well, St. Louis wasn't founded um, in 1764 uh, by accident. It was well planned from the beginning. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the early stuff. We're just going to talk about what really brought about this city in, in those years uh, from 1755 when 
uh, Pierre Laclede went to New Orleans, or arrived in New Orleans, and then up through uh, the early years of the 18th century. Um, New, New Orleans uh, was in something of economic distress. Uh, they needed um, industry, they needed trade uh, for the population. And with the Creoles coming in from Nova, Nova Scotia and others, like Pierre, came in from France. He was the youngest son in a fairly wealthy family. He was well educated. Uh, but being the youngest son, he wasn't going to be the primary beneficiary of the estate. So he took his inheritance and headed out of town and ended up in New Orleans in 1755. But the town was in distress. Um, uh, it was uh, really what amounted to the last bastion of French influence in the New World. Um, the English were coming. The French and, English and Indian Wars were um, uh, going on. Pontiac was warring and bringing scalps into the Fort de Chart of the English and proud to, to have them. And so the French in New Orleans and the the eastern uh, side of the upper Mississippi, Kaskaskia, Fort Deschart, uh, and some on the west side, um, St. Genevieve, all those French, and there were 100,000 French Americans in this country at that time, um, were nervous. They were very nervous. Um, and the governor of Louisiana and the, and the uh, principal mayor of New Orleans uh, wanted uh, something 1,200 miles or so upriver on the upper Mississippi um, as a bastion against uh, the English um, who, you know, if they took over that territory, they could come down river and really threaten New Orleans uh, too. So there were many reasons. He wanted trade and he wanted to access all the fur trade up here on the Missouri principally. He needed some protection on the upper Mississippi for the English that were coming in. Louis XV had ceded the eastern side of the Mississippi to the English in the Treaty of Paris the year before in 1763. And so Fort Deschartes, which was a massive fort with, that really protected all those outlying farming communities around it, um, was going to be turned over to the English. And uh, the French had nothing uh, to, to counterbalance that and to protect their influence, uh, remaining influence. What they didn't know was that Louis XV, the year before, had secretly traded uh, the west side of the Mississippi to his cousin Charles III in Spain. So they didn't know that. They didn't know it for a number of years uh, after that. So the governor of Louisiana, uh, Kerlach, uh, decided to give an exclusive six-year contract for the fur trade on the... Uh, oh, hi, how are you? Are you? <laughs> it's your email. Welcome. Okay. Thanks. I bring my French correct connection. Oh, of course. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're just getting going. So, uh, uh, um, Anyway, he gave, uh, and it, without the permission of Versailles or Louis XV, he didn't even go to France and try to get it. He just knew what he was doing, what he wanted. So Kerlach gave an exclusive six-year contract to one of his um, military men, uh, Colonel Maxence, in New Orleans, for the fur trade rights on the upper, uh, on the west bank of the Mississippi and the Missouri River. Um, because he thought that would uh, help New Orleans, it would, it would accomplish, if they were successful, all the things he wanted to accomplish as far as protection against the English and some economic benefit to New Orleans. Um, it helped that his brother-in-law was uh, St. Andrew Belle Reve um, in Fort de Chart, who was able to feed him in for, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it wasn't St. Ange, it was uh, um, Noyan Villar, uh, Villar, yeah. and Villar. That was his brother-in-law. So he was able to just feed him information on what was happening up on, uh, especially the eastern side of the Mississippi, but something of the west side, um, and his knowledge of the Indians. 
His family was from Montreal, and between all of them, he had 130 years' experience working with the, in with the Indians, and had, uh, was greatly respected by the tribes, including Pontiac, um, so that uh, uh, his brother-in-law in New Orleans, Carillac, had a high degree of confidence in the success of the mission, and Maxent um, uh, agreed to take it on and accepted the contract uh, to do it, on the, with the provision that McLeod, um, his junior partner, would form mount the exhibition and go upriver. Um, because Maxent wasn't going to do that. So they did. They spent a year gathering trading goods and supplies in New Orleans, um, all kinds of things uh, from the usual that you know of, um, uh, beads and cloth and iron that the Indians needed for implements and for knives and things like that, but also he took 300 pounds of gunpowder. But it took, when they left in August of 1763, it took them 85 days to, to uh, reach um, the upper reaches of the Mississippi in St. Jen, 85 days. And they left in August for very good reason, because I'm an official Coast Guard artist, and I've been out on this river quite a bit. Um, if you try to navigate going upriver in the spring, you're gonna face anywhere from a six to 10 minute current going down the river. And that's a lot to overcome when you've got rafts that are heavily laden with trade goods. And the way they moved upstream, they didn't just pull, uh, they had men on the shore with lines out, and they would take those lines ahead and stake them, and then pull and pull and move that raft forward, and then they would, you know, uh, like pin the raft to the ground and move the line ahead and they had to do that for 85 days before they got up here. But the current is in August is, when the water is lower, is much less. So it made it somewhat easier, but it still took them to November to reach uh, St. Genevieve. But St. Gen was a thriving community, but it was small. Uh, and they had, there was no place to store all the trade goods that they brought. So, um, Carillac's um, brother-in-law, who was commandant of Fort Deschartes, uh, knowing the importance of this whole mission, because I think he had something to do with uh, inspiring his brother, or his brother-in-law in New Orleans, to grant uh, the exclusive rights, he found storage, and they went, uh, and so they went upriver over to Fort Deschartes and stored all the goods. But, um, uh, McLeod was anxious to explore the, the river, and I think it was on uh, the Commandant's uh, direction. Uh, they went up river in November, and that's a pretty tough month to do it. A lot of ice is beginning to form, and it's pretty cold, but he was anxious, and they went up river. And I believe, and I think other, I mean, not, not just me, I think historians believe that uh, he was told to check out our bank because of the two miles of limestone cliffs uh, on this side that were also surmounted by 35-foot Indian mounds that were 400 years old and long since abandoned. And it was an ideal place. So the Cled, um, Chateau, and the 30 laborers came over here, loved the spot, and this is in November, and blazed a few trees, cut a few down, but then immediately went back to Fort Deschart with winter rapidly setting in. Um, but uh, Leclerc set up a trading post at Fort, uh, not right at Fort Deschart, but the little town outside uh, that where his goods were stored, set up a trading post. And the Indians from both sides of the river uh, quickly found out about it and began to trade over there. So the following February, when the ice was beginning to break up, must have been a warm winter because, you know, who knows, but anyway, um, Leclerc sent uh, Auguste Chouteau, and Auguste was only 13 years old when he came up river with Leclerc, so he's now 14 years old. And he was in charge of the laborers and um, the boat, 
and he sent him over here to start uh, building the first home, which was going to be the trading post and, and uh, his home, and that's what they did um, on February 15th. Uh, Leclerc himself didn't come until April. And it was in April that when he saw it, and everything was moving along nicely, the Indians were happy and they were beginning to trade over here, or beginning to know of the, there were no trading goods here yet at that time, but beginning to realize what was happening, that uh, he named the place St. Louis, and then he quickly returned to um, Fort Deschard to gather together the trading goods and to start getting that organized to come over here. Madame Chouteau, with uh, the four kids, um, arrived very quickly thereafter, either in October or November. So there wasn't much here, but she was a tough woman. Uh, and to give you a little bit of an idea, um, when Leclerc uh, um, entered New Orleans, or landed in New Orleans, he quickly joined the militia down there, which is how he got to know uh, Max Sent so well, because Max Sent was his colonel. Um, but he very, uh, he very quickly fell in love with Madame Chouteau. She was married, but her husband was a truant and had, after Auguste was born, he went back to France. So she had no husband, and of course it was uh, against the rules of, actually, the local rules, the rules of France and the rules of the Catholic Church that she couldn't get divorced and remarry. So she uh, characterized herself as a vouv, a widow, vouv chouteau. Um, so that when she and Leclerc uh, fell in love, they lived together, had four children, but because they weren't married, the children uh, could not take Leclerc's name. They all were named Chouteaus, which is why there are no Leclerc's and lots of Chouteaus. <laughs> um, uh, but she quickly followed upriver and came to St. Louis in October and November of the very first year they were here. Um, the uh, uh, Fort de Chartres was turned over to the English, uh, to the Black Watch Regiment um, in 64, I think, late in 64. And so, uh, well, it might have been 65, but I, I can't remember exactly which, but uh, when the English finally got in and took over the fort, this massive fort over there, um, the French on that side of the river had a decision to make. They could go at that time with Noyan back to New Orleans, which was the last bastion of French influence and city in, this, in, in the country. Or they could stay and um, you know, uh, work and live under English dominance. Or they could come to St. Louis, and it split all three ways. Many of the uh, wealthier ones uh, who could afford it and had means went down to New Orleans. Uh, the ones that were poor, poorer farmers stayed uh, on the eastern side of, of the Mississippi under English rule. But a large group of them, because now this town was forming, uh, came to St. Louis. And the town was laid out uh, very systematically with the New Orleans grid of streets, now the old colonial, you know, under the air grounds, um, and long farming plots. And the title was transferred. It was really a gift. There were no titles or contracts at the time. Uh, Chouteau and Leclerc uh, were really, uh, until the um, uh, saint ange de Reeve came over here and became kind of the official mayor and you know, ruling uh, body or individual, uh, everything was by verbal transfers. You just got this plot and there were long acreages. But the success of what of St. Louis and what went on here was totally uh, because of the French and the French um, uh, method of dealing with the Indians, which was one of trust and friendship, um, 
St. Ives de Bell Reeve was so well known to the Indians that the Indian tribes, even beginning in as early as 1769, would come to St. Louis annually. They would send delegations annually to St. Louis uh, to trade here and to meet and to get to know each other. Plus, there was a lot of intermarriage. Um, in 1769, there were 30 delegations from Indian, separate Indian tribes. By 1781, there was a huge meeting of 130 delegations of Indian tribes that came to St. Louis to meet, discuss the ramifications or the effect on them as a result of the American Revolution. Um, but the French, going back to the early days, treated the Indians with respect um, and as equals, especially Chateau. Auguste and his brother Pierre, Pierre went to live with the Osage um, and got to speak the language, uh, knew them well. That benefited everyone, the entire town, all the traders, New Orleans, everything that was going on because of, uh, of um, their relationship. The English thought both the French and the Indians ought to be ejected or killed. The English thought that it was, we were all uh, awful and against them, and it was because they were against everybody else. But, um, uh, so the, the Indians and the French had a great deal of trouble with the English. Um, at this time, however, until 1800, uh, this side of the river was under Spanish uh, rule. But, but that didn't mean a lot. Uh, Spain sent a representative to St. Louis in about 1769. Everything was in order. Uh, the place was functioning well, um, even that early, five years after. So they never did much. In 1800, France reacquired uh, the territory. But then, of course, um, Napoleon needed money, and so, fortunately, so he sold it off as quickly, within a few years, the Louisiana Purchase. And uh, you know, all of you all know what happened there. Um, Chouteau, uh, because of his position and because of his relationship with the Indian tribes, became a very wealthy man. When he died, he owned 50,000 acres. He, had, he was a banker, he was a trader, he was on the school board, it's the early school board in St. Louis, the board of trustees. Uh, he was extremely influential. But Madame Chouteau, in her own right, uh, was a very, she was a very smart lady, um, very talented, very able, married off her three daughters, um, uh, very successfully. Um, Pierre uh, died in, when he was 91 years old, um, and he, he was extremely successful. One of Madame Chouteau's uh, grandsons was the founder of Kansas City. He had gone over to Kansas City in 1810 to set up a trading post, and he was the founder of that city. Um, a little bit more about the Osage, though. The Osage were the dominant tribe in the entire Missouri River Basin. Um, they they controlled 100,000 square miles. The tribe was eight to 10,000 in number with 2,000 warriors. Um, but the Osage were known uh, as being giants. The average height of an Osage warrior was six foot six. And um, they ruled the roost. Uh, nobody messed with the Osage. Um, until much, much later when the U.S. government did. But, uh, you know, if you were friends with the Osage, and all of the St. Louisans were, um, you were successful. So, uh, St. all the fur trade, um, what the fur trade needed were the mammal hunters, which was the Osage tribesmen and warriors, and then the, uh, the ones who took the pelts, or took the animals, and made them into pelts. And the Osage women were 
extremely capable at doing that. So when you dealt with the Osage, you had everything you needed. And the Osage were in dire need uh, of many things, iron, muskets, balls, and gunpowder. And they got it all. So uh, it was a, uh, very much a two-way street. And uh, things went on very, very well for many, many years until the 19th century. So uh, the thing that um, the, the community needs to know and St. Louis's need to know about those early years is this town was founded with high purpose in planning. It wasn't that somebody pulled a boat up on the shore and said, oh, I think we're going to make it, make a town here and we're going to call it St. Louis because it was not that way. Uh, not at all. Any questions or? This lady speaks fluent French. <laughs> we're putting in August, we're going to dedicate downtown these historical markers uh, um, on seven of the original colonial streets that uh, radiate out from the colonial grounds underneath the arch. And Anne here uh, did all the final corrections on the French, because the historical markers are going to be in English and French, and the mayor's going to be dedicated at 1030 Wednesday, the 27th of August. God willing. <laughs> it, just, it just got sent yesterday. <laughs> um, so, questions? This isn't a question on your history, but I've, I've gone to several talks about the start of St. Louis. I'm going in about the limestone block that they fall. So when I drive down 270, you know, just north of 44, where they cut through it, and so you can see that limestone bluff. The topsoil is just the thinnest. So I wonder if anybody has any idea what the topsoil layer was on top of that bluff when they came. Because I don't know whether the buildings were the, you know, that French where they did this, where they would have had to have had topsoil. But you know, I, I don't know. But driving on 70, I'm thinking, is that what downtown looked like? It's just the thinnest layer of soil. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't know. But I know that they cut a basement into that first building um, and the Missouri Indians, uh, Shoto, when he wrote his journal, it was in 1801, so it was a long time later, but he talks about how women helped dig the, those foundations for that first building, but I don't know what they so were So for me, see my question, because this is so changed so much, just to wonder how much was on top of the rock, because uh, I don't know. In Missouri, we can see the slides. But there were the mounds, and the mound dirt had to come from somewhere. So it could have been pretty thin material because they had to get those. There was not just the one big mound. There were a number of smaller, but the biggest was 32 feet added elevation on top of the bluffs. Let me talk about one other thing that's in here in the exhibition. Hi, folks. Come on in. Pull up a chair. Uh, and that's this work over here by Ferdinand McCain. Uh, this is not the original. Um, both Olivia and I the wanted the original in here, but let me explain. The original to this work is in the back wall of an archive on the second floor of the old courthouse. And it's seven feet tall and it's ten feet wide, weighs half a ton and is under glass that's about a quarter of an inch thick. And there's no element. <laughs> we wanted that in here, and it was going to go if we got it, you know, right in here somewhere because it's so impressive. And the frame, the frame is monumental. I mean, it's just fabulous. And we saw it many, many times. But the cost to move it out of the, and it is, well, I'll get to one of those last examples, but the cost to move it out of the courthouse in here and return it was $15,000. And we still had to build a special stand frame because you couldn't lean it against this wall you know, or hang it on hooks. Uh, it just wasn't going to work. So <coughs> Olivia had this canvas reproduction made. Now, Ferdinand Lacan uh, painted it sometime in the 1790s. Not 1890s. Or 1890s, that's right, 1890s. Thank you. <laughs> Too many damn dates, excuse me. <laughs> um, and it was exhibited in 1900 in Paris at the Paris Exposition. And then it came here for the World's Fair. Uh, and 
Um, then it found its way to Nodler and Company uh, in New York City. Nodler was an art dealer. And they, they closed about four years ago under a very dark cloud. They were one of the oldest, most prestigious fine art dealers in the U.S. in New York City. I mean, John Singer Sargent's watercolors, that big show, all those, they had them, all that stuff went through Nodler. Anyway, they had it, and Henry Clay Frick bought it from them for $1,500, I think, yeah. <laughs> something like that, $1,500. And it ended up in uh, the Union Building in Pittsburgh, Union Bank Building, in the Frick Building, Union Bank Building. And when he died, his daughter got it. And when the bank merged uh, into someone else, um, she gave it to the St. Louis Chamber of Commerce. And the St. Louis Chamber of Commerce unveiled it here in St. Louis at the in the Jefferson Building or something, about 1950. After that, it went, they loaned it to the National Park Service in the old courthouse in 1951. And uh, I'm not sure it was ever on exhibit in the old courthouse. I don't think we know whether it was or not. We know about the unveiling, but we don't think it was. The, it got, the loan got converted to a gift in 1961. But it has been in the back wall of the archive with all the stuff stacked in front of it for 50 or more years. And uh, at one time, the curator over there told me that one of the preceding director, or the preceding director of the National Park Service, wanted to get it out and put it in his office. And they couldn't figure out how to get it out, so it stayed there. So no one's ever seen it. Um, and we wanted to get it here, but we couldn't get enough money scratched together from donors to pay the 15000 So, uh, um, but this is clearly, you know, if you pick up the catalog and read Olivia's description, I mean, clearly it's an idealized, romanticized um, uh, view of the founding. You know, it was a religious moment, angels in the sky, you know, I mean, everything was going on there. If you look behind the TV, there's probably a VW bus with a peace symbol on it. So, um, uh, it, but, you know, I mean, McCain painted it from his imagination and whatever descriptions he might have had. Of, and he might have seen other um, artists renditions of Native Americans and, yeah. you know, he wasn't really, he didn't know what, who was right. here, so he kind of did the standard Plains Indians kind of iconic um, teepees. Um, and they didn't live in they teepees. Didn't, yeah, they didn't live in teepees. <laughs> oh, so they didn't have teepees. <laughs> so, are there plans to get it out of their archives? There are no plans. I mean, for the, I guess the new museum has yeah. Get it out. 
but since we didn't do that, um, who knows? Uh, a couple of other things around uh, um, the ex exhibition is in four rooms here. Um, be sure you look at that uh, trader's bead box back there in the third room. That's a really pretty fabulous piece. And the fact that it survived um, this long, because it's uh, it came from the Osage Travel Museum, which, by the way, needs a great deal of help and money, because all of these things from them, and they have wonderful things. The, their travel museum in Pawhuska, Oklahoma, is in an old 19th century school building. It's not properly uh, air conditioned, temperature controlled, humidity controlled. This stuff is at great risk there, but they don't have the money. And, and uh, it's, I guess, not on their tribe's you know, great list of. Uh, um, to do anything about immediately, but the fact that that bead box uh, survived uh, like it did, it's a pretty neat thing to look at. And then some of the other Osage pieces, this is Mad Dog's uh, shield. Um, now it doesn't date from the period because we're talking about the founding in 1764, but things like this, clothing, implements, unless they were iron or wood, are not going to survive cloth. You know, it's not going to make it. This piece here is sort of from where this... Um, oh, right here in the stand. Yeah, right behind you. Roughly the from the period. So, um, um, we didn't mention the Sunset Country Club's burning house over here is a lender. August Bush gave that a burning house painting right there to the Sunset Country Club. Well, finding it turned out not to be as hard. Getting it was the problem. <laughs> and the other not to be missed is in the contemporary exhibit. Um, there's a piece uh, that we commissioned by uh, Eugene Sean Standing Bear, who's an um, Osage artist. Um, and he did a, an imagining what the founding of St. Louis and his interpretation is, you know, was very interesting. He talked about how he had, um, the scene that he sets is sort of a, an elder standing and being told by a younger member of the, the tribe that, you know, there are these people arriving and he's kind of a little bit up in arms about it, but the elder is kind of calm about it and you can see the little boats in the distance and you can see the mounds and so, yeah, it's, it's a really neat, neat, um, and I want to commend you both for the, for this book. I don't know if some of you are aware of this book. Yeah. I came down for autographs, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think they did a great, no longer with us. <laughs> I think they did a great job, and it's mm -hmm. an excellent job. And there's a companion book, we just got it for the other exhibit, which is our grass roots component to this whole celebration. Citywide uh, photo contest that lasted about six, seven months. And out of that, uh, a jury of four selected 100 images to be part of the exhibit, and then we had an additional 150 that were on the slide loop. And that also has a book. Um, so it's a really nice sort of celebration of St. Louis today. Um, we made them so that they are their kind of companion, they kind of fit together as a pair. So, thank you. Great Here's gifts. Here's your going today. <laughs> Great Christmas morning. Yeah. Holiday gifts. <laughs> any other questions or anything else? Then do you, do you yes. know of like any significant, I guess, event where we got away from our French heritage? Like, St. Louis is a city. Was there something that... Like the American yeah. 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 That's yeah. probably why. Esley Hamilton or Mimi could tell you more about that, but I don't know. Personally, Kathy and I are only eight years St. Louis, and so. Um, so I know about, it was probably about 10 years ago, they, um, someone came up from St. Genevieve, and there were still a couple people down there that had a certain French dialect around that area. I don't know if it's still. Sure, it's still in use. Oh, yeah. It's still on terre. I mean, yeah. there are old lines, stand out lines, old lines but there are fewer, fewer. Fewer, yeah. But I mean, uh, someone was just telling me uh, the other day, it was John Hoover of the Mercantile Library, that he has evidence that 
French was still being spoken in Edwardsville, Illinois, up to 1819. And I'm presently working on a French language newspaper called La Revue de l'Ouest um, that I'm writing a book on, and its editor, Louis Colombert, who married Suzanne Trudeau. So that was in 1854. That this, we had other newspapers written in French in the day, but with the influx of the Germans coming in with their uh, beer and the Germans, oh, the Germans. <laughs> Soulard and more of them moved south towards Carondelet area, the French, when the influx of the Germans came in. So this is this is all hearsay, by the way. Yeah. I, I happen to have an attorney background too. So this is this is not, I mean we were all weren't there, so there's no real proof of this, but this is all by word of mouth and what stories were told. Um, and because they got to long, coming, you know, from and then America from uh, right, and from the east, Kentucky. Right, you know, that whole movement of, of, of well, the big name Daniel. But surprisingly, what's really surprising for, numbers, for St. Louis is that we had a number of French coming from France, okay? Because there was uh, different areas like Michigan and other areas of this country that were mainly uh, founded uh, with French moved over to Quebec and then from Quebec coming down to the United States. But really for St. Louis, it's surprising how many French came from France, okay, originally in Perryville, all that get established, and then the French themselves have records now going back on the internet. You can uh, quickly research your family at front to somebody from Perryville, where they are called in now, right now. So that was what was surprising because the old established French families actually wanted their daughters being married to Frenchmen from France. Okay, so that's how like Louis Colombert, when he came over from France, he married into the Chateau family. A lot of them were married. From what I understand from Fred, a lot of the French men preferred to marry the Osage women. Well, or have them as girlfriends. Yeah. Well, there was yeah. so much intermarrying now with that? DNA. It would right. be interesting right. to see how much Osage blood are. Yeah. Well, there actually is, from what I hear, there are quite a number of Chateau last names. Thanks for coming. Take a few minutes.